mentioned as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And he said, Now here's a prophecy, my friends, that in the latter days they'll come. Such times as there had never been, and never will be once again. It's in my shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in many places now here's another word of truth there shall be wars and rumors too and many earthquakes there will be the time is so near can't you see it's in my Accept the Lord into your hearts. There is no other way, my friends. It's in my shall pass away, but these words will never pass away, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Newswatch Magazine presents... The analysis of world news in the light of Bible prophecy with David J. Smith. Jesus Christ has given us in no uncertain terms way marks of which we can identify when the end of the age is coming. And after all, every single Christian since Christ was ascended into the heavens and the original disciples saw him at that time have always wondered when will Christ return. In every generation, they've always thought this will be the time when Christ will come. Jesus wanted to lay to rest exactly some of the thoughts that those people had in those days. But the problem is that they could not understand because the time had not arrived. 
And so the understanding of Bible prophecy and of the end of the age was not within their understanding. However, when that generation did arrive on the scene, God's Holy Spirit would begin to show them that the end of the age was coming very, very shortly. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 and 2, here was Jesus and the disciples. They had been visiting in the temple. And when they departed from the temple, his disciples asked him to look back at all of these giant buildings, the beauty of them, the architecture, the well-constructed buildings of the temple and its surrounding area. In verse 2, And Jesus said to them, See you not all of these things? Verily or truly I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now Jesus was beginning to tell them something. They hadn't grasped it yet. Many people in the religious community look at 70 A.D. when the Romans came and destroyed the temple and the city. And they say, well, Bible prophecy was fulfilled. That's what Jesus was talking about. So we can't look at Matthew 24 and apply it to the end of the age. Oh, we'll see whether that's true or not by the time we're finished with the message today. The temple in 70 A.D. was not destroyed. Every single stone cast down. There's a whole section of the Wailing Wall today in which the Jews in the Middle East go and they cry and they touch it and they say their prayers, longing for the day when the temple will be rebuilt, when the Messiah will come on the scene and there will be a restoration and the kingdom of God will come and be established and everything that they had ever dreamed of and been taught from the Holy Scriptures would finally come to pass. There will be a temple in the last days. There are many, many scriptures that tell us exactly that. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, it says this, Because some of the people of that day were sitting down, they weren't working, they weren't supporting themselves, they weren't supporting the ministry, they weren't even supporting their families, because they thought immediately the kingdom was going to be established. So Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Yes, don't let anything change your mind from the belief system that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom, the gospel, the good news that there is coming a government that will finally bring peace, prosperity, happiness in every situation in life to the human race. Don't ever forget that. That's what you've been called to believe. Or be troubled, neither by spirit, yes, the unseen spirit world, Satan is leading that. And one-third of the angels followed him in rebellion, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. In other words, hearsay. Falsified letters saying, it's time, flee, as that the day of Christ is at hand. No, no one is supposed to listen to these type things. The only thing that we can place our confidence and trust upon is Jesus Christ, His words, His inspired words from the Bible written down on paper, put together by the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos between 90 and 96 A.D. and is handed down to us today. Verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. So deception would be the hallmark of the day, even among Christians, especially if they have itching ears and they want to hear some new thing instead of staying on the foundation. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. You cannot fall away from something that you do not have. If you have the truth of God, you can fall from it. 
But if you're already in error and you're already in deception, you cannot fall into deception. Only those who have the truth of God can be caught up in a falling away. And that that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, when is he going to be revealed? What is he going to be doing? Where is he going to be revealed as giving his instructions to the rest of the world? Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I've heard about as many heresies as I could ever hear about what this means. It's been fostered that this means a man sitting in the church. That could not be. Because when you look up the Greek word temple, it means a shrine. It literally means an edifice, a building. So he will be sitting in a building somewhere, showing himself that he's God. What building is he going to be sitting in? Will it be this temple? After all, we see no activity visibly today that there is going to be a temple rebuilt. How quickly can they build one? If all the building blocks are already been hewn to size, they could build it very quickly if they were given permission to do so. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, then I'll drop down to verse 10. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So it's very clear here that this is a revealing, not a closing, but it's a revealing. It's making something known, and it's Jesus Christ that is making it known to his servants. Not to the rest of the world necessarily. Oh, they may have some surface understanding of these things, just like those in the New Age movement. They think that they are the red horse of the apocalypse. They're fulfilling prophecy by wiping out many of mankind through wars, through giving them inoculations and so on, filled with HIV virus all across Central Africa. They think they're fulfilling the Bible. And they probably are, but on the opposite side, not God's side. But he said that it would be for his servants, and it would show them short things that would shortly come to pass. Now the phrase shortly come to pass is number 1722 in the Greek Strong's Concordance. And also, you compare it with number 5084 in the Greek Strong's Concordance. It means to watch for a position in time. So what is this position in time that we're to watch for? Was it 70 A.D. when the Romans came and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem? No, because Jesus said very clearly that every single stone would be thrown down. And the whole wailing wall was left standing. Now look down in verse 10 and let's identify this position in time. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. The phrase, on the Lord's day, is led with a preposition, on. Now this could have been translated from the Greek language as one of four different prepositions. It could have been on, in, at, or by. Now, it must, according to verse 1, have a position in time. It must talk about time. And since we're watching for this position in time, the only accurate preposition that could have been placed there was in. So the Apostle John was going to be projected forward into the day of the Lord, in the Lord's day. Not 70 A.D., but in the Lord's day. 
So it should have said, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. The very close of the age when all of Bible prophecy will be fulfilled. Now why am I making this point and belaboring it? The book of Revelation is for the end of the age, the Lord's day. Now let's turn in the book of Revelation to chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Here's instructions. Now all of this is in vision. It didn't really happen, but it was in vision. And John was to write it down. Verse 1 and 2. There was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar in them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out. Well, what is that court that's without the temple? Don't even measure it. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty-two months. There will be a temple sometimes that is going to be constructed during the fifth or sixth trump. Chapter 11 is after the sixth trump. Now, if it's in chronological order, it means once the sixth trump sounds, this temple will be built. But it is a temple. And it says very clearly that the holy city, and that's Jerusalem, that's the only holy city ever mentioned in the Bible. That's where the great king, Jesus, will rule, rule from. Jeremiah three seventeen and 18 says so. And it says very clearly they will tread under or they will occupy, they will conquer Jerusalem the last 42 months. And that's where the temple is going to be located. That's where this man of sin is going to set himself up, proclaiming that he is God. This is the temple that's being talked about by Jesus Christ. That at a certain point, every single stone is going to be cast down. Then you're going to know that Jesus Christ is about to return to this earth. It's going to be one of the signposts. That's why we keep our eyes on the Middle East, even though we live in a country that is succumbing to the new world order and we're losing a little more of our sovereignty through all of these treaties with other nations. And it saddens us. And through continuous high alerts of terror and then terrorist activities, we lose a little more of our Bill of Rights and our guaranteed freedoms till the day comes when martial law is called. But in Matthew 24, verse 3, then there are three monumental questions that are asked because when Jesus said, made his statement in verse 2, their minds began to race. They began to think, well, what in the world is he talking about? So as they approached and went up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So this was going to be a private lesson saying, tell us, when shall these things be? These things, what are these things? Well, the destruction of the temple, that's what he mentioned. And what shall be the end or the sign of your coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age in which Satan the devil is ruling? <clears throat> when will the kingdom of God be established? When will it come and supersede the kingdom that Satan is giving rise to? <clears throat> So those are the three questions. When is the destruction of the temple going to become reality? What generation is going to see that? What shall be the sign of your coming, implying the second coming of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the kingdom of God? And then what will be the sign of the end of the world? Meaning, as we know it today, which will supersede the governments of this world. It'll become the kingdom of God. Matthew 24 is a stepping stone in telling us when Jesus Christ will be here. We won't know the date of the hour, but we'll certainly know the signs. We will be able to see that our salvation is near, and that's when we can look up with great hope, great anticipation. 
But the prophet Daniel has been told part of the signs of the end of the age, and they dovetail right into Matthew 24. They dovetail right into Revelation, the entirety of the book. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel had been taking all of these visions. At one point, he laid three weeks face down, just exhausted. Because all of the visions that had come into his head and they were so frustrating to him because he didn't understand any of them. So in verse 4, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words. Seal the book. In other words, when you seal something, no one can determine what the meaning of it is. Even to the time of the end. That automatically tells us when the time of the end comes there is going to be someone that will understand. Jesus Christ said in Revelation 1 that His servants would understand. Now here is one of the books that Jesus Christ inspired to be written before He came in a human form. He was the God of the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4 said that He led Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He's the one that gave Him His spiritual law on Mount Sinai. What are the identifying signs right here in verse 4? Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. He mentioned world travel. In order to leap oceans, you have to have aircraft. Because going by ship takes time. And it says... Many shall run to and fro, implying that it's going to be speedily. It's not going to be by camel, horse, and buggy anymore. And then he said knowledge shall be increased. The word knowledge means submitting to, subduing. What did God say back there in Genesis 1.28 when he made man? He said that we were to subdue the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, here is Jesus Christ back in the Garden of Eden after He had made man, blown into His nostrils a breath of life. He blew His lungs up. He began to breathe voluntarily. He told Him to subdue. The word subdue means that you learn the basic elements what makes the earth. Then you combine these things together to create new things. So they make brick. They make mortar. They make asphalt. They build highways. They build roads. They build houses. They build cities. Then they put together other technology and they build aircraft. They build tanks for war, cars to travel. Webster's Dictionary says the word knowledge means recognition, familiarity gained by actual experience. So hands-on experience in laboratories have taught men. And now in modern day times, knowledge is increasing every two and a half years. We see that in the electronics industry. It also means practical skills, or technical acquaintance with facts, technology, possession of information, clear perception of facts and truths. And when you have a clear perception of something, you can build tanks, you can build jet aircraft, supersonic aircraft that goes across the oceans at supersonic speeds. You can send men in orbit around the earth. They can land on the moon. You can send satellites orbiting around Saturn and sending pictures back of the rings. You can do many things when you have a clear perception of facts and truths, and that's what it means to subdue the earth. It's instruction, it's learning, synonyms. Words having the same meaning as knowledge or wisdom, science, information. So clearly today we have some of those as radio, television, 
People can hook up and listen to conference calls or speeches such as this from all over the world by internet. They can hook up with telephones and hear anywhere in the world if they dial into the system. And so this is a part of the knowledge that has been gained in the 20th and the 21st century. We can send voices and pictures through the air, but they're invisible to you and I. There's sound waves going through this auditorium right now, probably hundreds of them. But because we didn't tune into the right frequency, we don't hear them. If we had a receiver and tuned into the right frequency, we could listen. This is all technology, things that have been learned. This is the knowledge that has been increased in the 20th and 21st century. Does this prove that we're living in a part of the times that Jesus said, Begin to look up. Your salvation is near. These tools can either be used for good or for evil, either one, according to how government, according to how businesses decide to use them. But what signs did Jesus give? Other signs, and can we identify them very clearly? I'll only have time for one today. That's why I mentioned radio and television. Because these are technological advances that take voices all over the world. They can be used for good or evil. To clarify the truth or to deceive. Matthew chapter 24 verse 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Because of the three questions they ask, Take heed that no man deceive you. So Jesus made it very clear that something could be used for deceptive purposes. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now this is an answer to the question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world or the end of the age as it is today? So how could many people be deceived while believing that Jesus is truly the Messiah? That's an enigma. People can't understand how they could be deceived and yet believe in Jesus Christ. Yet Jesus said many would come and deceive. So that means if many come and deceive, that means many are deceived. Now, we're not talking about sincerity. Somebody would not believe what they do if they didn't sincerely believe it. You can sincerely believe something and be absolutely wrong. You can be given wrong information, wrong facts, misunderstandings, and therefore it would lead you down the wrong path. You would be deceived. You would not have the truth. So this says that many, meaning ministers, would come and they would use the name of Jesus. Now what is in a name? When you look up in the dictionary, it shows that what is in a name is authority. If someone comes in the name of Jesus, it's in the authority of Jesus. So here we're told that many would come in the authority of Jesus, or at least they would say they're coming in the authority of Jesus. And they would still deceive the masses. But they would sincerely believe they're a Christian with all of their heart, and you cannot convince them otherwise. Unless God's Holy Spirit intervenes in their life and shows them. Jesus personally gave the answer as to how it's done. The Bible usually interprets itself somewhere. And in this case, Jesus' very own words tells how people can come in His name, seemingly by His authority, seemingly 
He sent them only seemingly and yet can deceive and lead the masses down the primrose path toward destruction. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Now here is Jesus. If all else fails, you always go to the very words of Jesus. He, he said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, not everybody that recognizes that Jesus is the master and controller is going to be in the kingdom. But he that doeth, the old King James word, I like to put it in modern English, he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now the word doeth or does is number 4160 in the Greek Strong's Concordance and it means to do. And this is a compound word of number 4238, which means to practice. It means to perform repeatedly or habitually. So here is something that people are doing habitually. If you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you're going to perform what God says in His book. That is the revelation to mankind. His manual to fix the problems in our lives. But what about those that are deceiving? Verse 22 and 23. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And remember, name carries authority. Didn't we prophesy by the authority of you, Jesus, the Christ? And in your name or by your authority have cast out demons? The word here in King James is devils, but there's only one devil, there's many demons. And in your name or by your authority done many wonderful works? Then comes the answer that is not very well received in the religious community today. Nobody likes to admit they've ever made a mistake. Nobody wants their pride to be hurt and say, I was deceived. Nobody. But if a person wants the true God, they will have to. Verse 23. Then will I profess unto them, now remember this is Jesus talking. This is not David J. Smith. I'm only reading what Jesus said. I never knew you. You said you were a Christian. You said you came in my authority. I don't even know who you are. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now this is strange. Somebody working miracles in the name by the authority of Jesus. Yet he said, I don't even know you. I didn't send you to work those miracles. Why? Because you work iniquity. So I could have nothing to do with you. The word iniquity in the Greek language is number 458 in the Strong's Concordance. It means illegality. So they worked illegal things. Violation of God's law. So here were ministers that would come and they would claim to have worked miracles, cast out demons, done many wonderful works. And yet Jesus said, I don't even know you because you have lived a life of violating my law. And this word, iniquity, comes from the more root word, number 459, which means lawless. Not subject to law. By implication, the Gentile nations of the world did not receive the law of God on Mount Sinai. The Israelites did. Anyone on earth could accept the Messiah and the circumcision of Israel. Today in the church, it's of the heart. And they could obey the law and they could be counted as home-born citizens. So he said, look, you break my law. 
I didn't send someone that breaks my law to work these miracles. There must be another spirit. So how could all this be? How could these people claim the name of Jesus? And it's true, there have been miracles worked by people that have violated God's law. And they even teach the law is nailed to the cross. It's done away. You don't have to obey it. And they talk about it in very harsh terms. Yet they've worked miracles and claim that it was done in Jesus' name by His authority. So how could all this be? How could sincere ministers live and teach others to violate God's law? It's really simple when we believe the Bible, that it is inspired, that Jesus Christ gave it to us as a manual. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6 to 8, he says, for to be carnally minded, that's naturally minded, the way we were born is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So here are ministers that teach God's law is done away. And Jesus said, look, I don't even know you. I didn't send you to perform these miracles. You did them in my name. And it was honored and somebody was healed. You did good works, but you lived a lifestyle of lawlessness. You were doing it from a carnal standpoint. How could that be? Because Jesus said, if you have His Holy Spirit, He will lead you into all truth, not error. You will be led into truth, and you will accept truth when you hear truth. You will hear the Master's voice. He's the great shepherd of the sheep, and you will recognize this is truth. It is right. Look at the conclusion of being hostile to God's law. Because Jesus said, all of those ministers, and there were many of them, that were leading people into deception. It said they were workers of iniquity, which is lawlessness. Verse 9, Romans chapter 8. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So the Spirit of God must dwell inside of your mind for you to be a real Christian. Someone who is being led into all truth, who accepts that truth. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He's not a Christian. That's why Jesus said to all these ministers that were leading people astray, that were living a lifestyle of lawlessness, violating God's spiritual law. I don't know you. Because they weren't Christians. They were sincere, many of them. There are some that use trickery. I remember one time, I won't call the man's name, but he had a machine that created fog. And he had a fan, and it would blow out from under a door out into the audience. And he said, see, the Holy Spirit's coming into the room. And oh, he had those people in a frenzy. It was all fake, fraud. Many will come in my name, saying I'm Jesus, and deceive the many. It happens everywhere. You and I just don't know about it. I remember one time in St. Louis, a woman had her son in a daycare because she couldn't afford anything else. It was a freebie. She walked in to get her son one day, and this was a religious organization that had the daycare. It seemed that by that time of the day, the children were out of control and running wild, and here was a young boy about four or five years old, a little taller than a fold-up chair. Here he leaped in the air and in slow motion went over two rows of chairs. Oh, there was a spirit there that day, but it wasn't God's Holy Spirit. 
she took her son out immediately of that daycare. So the stinging indictment of another book in the Bible goes along with what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5, that many would come. They would deceive many because they're running on their own. The Holy Spirit must be inside of their mind to lead them into truth, not error. Jeremiah chapter 23 is that book and the chapter that gives a very stinging indictment of ministers today. And a summary of this whole book, and I'm going to show it to you, and you can see it with your own eyes. Basically, it says that they teach from their own physical mind, not led of the Holy Spirit. So how could they lead people into the truth? They can only lead them into error. Put this down. I won't even charge you for this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 to 16. It says very, very clearly that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. It reveals to us the deep things of God. Everything else is surface. And without the Holy Spirit, you don't understand the deep things of God. Jeremiah 23, verse 1 and 2. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you've scattered my flock, you've driven them away, you've not visited them, you've not visited them with a truth out of my Bible. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, says the Lord. Now that's a very stinging indictment against the pastors that are supposed to be feeding God's people. But the key is, when is he speaking about? Was it back in Jeremiah's day? Was it when Christ walked the earth? Was it during the Middle Ages? Or is there a verse right here in the middle of the stinging indictment that tells us precisely that it's exactly what Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5 said as a signpost leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, Jeremiah 23. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it perfectly. He says the latter days. Right now as I speak to you, this is the latter days. There are pastors that are everywhere deceiving by teaching God's law was done away. Therefore, they live a lifestyle of lawlessness. They teach once saved, always saved meaning now in this physical life. And so if you fall away, you're not really falling away. God's already forgiven you in advance. So it gives you an excuse to live however you want to. And believe me, they take advantage of them. I know many, many people who have done that. They believe that they cannot lose salvation, so they live by the flesh. What will God do to solve the problem of false teachings that have scattered his people? What's he going to do? They go from one church to another. They're never spiritually filled because they're not being taught God's truth. So there's always a hunger left. Maybe I can find something to fill my spiritual hunger down the street. When they can't find it at the first, mm -mm, then they go to the second, mm -mm, and then they go over to the next church. And they just go make a round robin. And then they hear that a minister has left one church, so maybe they'll try that one again and they get the same answer. 
No spiritual food. Look in Jeremiah 23, because what's Jesus going to do about it? Verse 3 to 8. I'll gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I've driven them. This is after he comes. We'll bring them again to their folds. They shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them which will feed my flock or feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord, lacking spiritually because they're going to be fed God's word. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is when the deception is going to stop. You know, every prophet of God has always been sent. They prophesied. And Jesus said, you killed. Talking about the northern tribes of Israel, said you killed all the prophets. They didn't repent. They just blamed the one that took the message instead of turning back to the God that sent the messenger. But he says, I'm going to come personally this time. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore the days come, says the Lord, that they shall say no more. The Lord lives, which brought us up brought the children of Israel out of the land of bondage. But the Lord lives, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. And from all countries, whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. But who are going to be these shepherds? Jesus is coming to rule. There's going to be shepherds. He said he would appoint shepherds. That's plural. Over his people and ultimately the world because all nations will come to Jesus Christ. But you know, there is a message that has gone out. It's called the gospel, the good news of the coming kingdom of God. That there is a Messiah that died to pay the penalty of guilt. For violating the very laws that are ruling the kingdom. That's God's laws. We can have all of those sins forgiven because Jesus died. That's a part of the gospel. But the second part of the gospel is that once our sins have been forgiven, you and I can qualify under the authority of Jesus Christ to become kings and priests. We will judge under Jesus this world. You are the ones who are going to be established as the shepherds if you remain faithful unto the end. Daniel 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. You are a saint if God's Holy Spirit is inside of your mind. If you understand this book and the words that are spoken... And the words when you read them. Notice verse 27 of Daniel chapter 7. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Jesus will be the King of kings. You and I will be the other kings. And other people like us around the world that we don't even know exist, but God has given a spirit of understanding to them. They have repented. They have turned. They're listening to the voice of the shepherd. They're being led beside green pastures. Revelation 1, verse 4 to 6. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is. He presently exists and was. He existed back in Old Testament times and which is to come. In other words, he's eternal. 
and from the seven spirits which are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. So here is God the Father now in Jesus, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Notice what He's done now in verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You and I have not been called to sit and twiddle our thumbs and boredom floating around in cl clouds for eternity. We've been called to become rulers, kings, priests. We have a destiny. God has called us. That's why He's opened our minds to the truth. Notice Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. Who it is that's going to be these shepherds that Jesus is going to establish. I'll drop down in the latter part of verse 9. And has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Yes, you and I have been redeemed. Bought back. Purchased from the death penalty. We don't have to worry about dying anymore. Our every thought should be overcoming our natural nature so that we can become like Jesus Christ and God the Father's divine nature. Lay our petty little thoughts to the side and realize the big picture that God is working in us while He is not working necessarily in the majority of mankind at this time. Oh, He will. But he's calling kings and priests today to become the shepherds to teach people the truth of God when Jesus Christ rules. Notice Matthew 19, verse 27 and 28. Peter wanted to know what would happen to them if they forsaken everything and followed Jesus. He said, what are we going to have? Verse 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily or truly I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration or the resurrection to the new glorified spirit-composed body, when the Son of Man shall sit in, his, in the throne of His glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That was the original apostles. Jesus has a position for you. All you have to do is remain faithful and not become sidetracked. When the kingdom of God is established, then false ministers will cease to speak on the earth. Satan will be placed in the abyss and his angels for 1,000 years. There will be no more deception. When you and I and others, all the way from righteous Abel, that have ever had God's Holy Spirit are resurrected or changed, and we're given that new body, and we're given our position of responsibility, then we will teach humanity, those that are left alive and those that will be resurrected from the dead. There will be no more false teachers. They will unlearn everything that they had been taught from Mystery Babylon the Great and her daughters, churches that is. But look what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said as the Lord God of the Holy Prophets in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 9 to 11. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. Now this is Jeremiah talking. All my bones shake. And remember, this is the latter days. He's seeing down through the corridors of time. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord. 
Yes, He gave me these words and, and all of these false prophets. I can't take it. And because of the words of His holiness, for the land is full of adultery. For because of swearing, the land mourns. Yes, false oaths. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. Things are going wrong with the world. And their course is evil. Look around the world today and find righteous people. And their force is not right. Why are they not right? Look at verse 11. For both prophet and priest are profane. In my house have I found their wickedness, says the Lord. And this is the latter days. He said the prophet and the priest were profane. This is a Hebrew word, profane, number 2610 in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. In a moral sense, it means they are corrupt, they are defiled because they don't obey God's spiritual laws. They teach they're done away. They're nailed to the cross. They're only for the Jews, they say in Old Testament times, not even realizing there were 12 tribes of Israel, not just one, Judah. That shows the ignorance of the ministers today. Jeremiah 23, verse 12 and 13. Wherefore there, these false ministers, these prophets, self-proclaim prophets and priests, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> therefore their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I'll bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation, says the Lord. You want to be a minister? Self-proclaimed and do it yourself? You just saw what he said. There is not going to be pleasurable for those that are feeding falsely the flock of God and taking them further and further away from the true God. I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. What was Samaria? It was the capital city of the northern ten tribes of Israel that was taken into national captivity, sifted through the nations. So this is a stand-in for the modern-day capital of wherever the ten tribes of Israel are, the capital city of Joseph's two sons. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. So Samaria was the capital city of the northern ten tribes of Israel. That modern day capital today would be like Washington, D.C., London, England, where the lost ten tribes of Israel have migrated and planted their livelihood. Notice verse 16 now of Jeremiah 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the old King James word, hearken, doesn't make much sense today. That's like if you have a coal and you got to hark up your stuff. Uh, that, that's not good. Let's put it in modern English. Listen not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. The word vain is number 1891 in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. It means to act or in word or expectation. You're acting in vain. Well, what does vain mean? Specifically to be led astray. So here is someone specifically leading God's people astray by their actions, by their words, and they give expectations to the people that they know is not true. Such as one that I heard, and it was all over the national news when it happened, a minister that had founded a huge university. He said, God told me that if I didn't get five or eight million dollars, I don't remember which it is, by a certain date, he was going to kill me. Now, if anybody believed that, they, had to, they ought to be seeing the doctor. You know, and that's a doctor of psychiatry. But the money poured into him. 
He gave them false expectations. Then others preach, if you'll just give my ministry $10,000, God will give you a million dollars or $100,000 or whatever it might be. False expectations that are never found in the Word of God. That's why God is condemning and giving an indictment to the ministers of the Israel today. Webster's Dictionary says the word vain means empty. Yes, they get up and they make empty promises that they cannot fulfill and that God will not fulfill because He's not behind them. Now there's another spirit that may try to help them to fool more people. The word vain also means devoid of real value or worth or meaning. That's why the, a lot of people are called flockers. They flock to this church on this corner and they can't get anything. So they flock to the church on the next corner. They don't get anything spiritually there. So they flock to the next church. It also means worthless, fruitless, futile. This is what God thinks about the ministers today. No, not His ministers that are truly feeding His people. We're talking about the false ministers. They twist Scripture to fit their preconceived ideas that they learn from Mystery Babylon the Great, which is a mother church. And the Bible is not very pleasant in what it calls them. In Jeremiah 23, verse 17, it says, They say still unto them that despise me. Whoa, what a statement. Here are ministers that are saying things. And the Bible says they despise him. Well, how in the world do you despise or do you dishonor God? By violating his spiritual law, just like it said in Matthew 7, 23, or 7 verse 23. They say there's coming a great revival of the Christian community in America today when the Bible says the exact opposite. It says there's coming a famine of the hearing of the Word. But there will come a revival of false Christianity. Oh, yes, but not the truth. The Lord has said, now here's what these ministers say, you shall have peace. Yes, there's going to be a great revival of Christianity. And they say unto every one that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to be raptured out in advance of the great tribulation. I dare not show you the truth from the Bible or I won't have you sending me your pledges, your thousands of dollars, so that I can go to the bank every week. Or put it in a vault and dive in. And roll around in the money. While God's ministers are poorer. Because they're little flocks. Not very many listen to the truth. Only those that are going to be kings and priests. No, they don't want anybody to believe that there is going to ever be a finger lifted against anyone that is a Christian at the end of the age because it will cause their empire to collapse and their money will dry up. They say, let's cut out Revelation 13, 7 out of the Bible. That way nobody will see it. Well, I'm going to read it so anybody that hears this will know it's in there. Talking about the rise of the beast system in verse 1. Now verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. When you overcome them, it does not sound like you're going to be raptured out in advance. Seven years before Christ comes. And then when you turn and you look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then the other seals that are stripped open, Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a little voice, saying, How long, O Lord? 
holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Those that killed us. When are you going to take vengeance upon them? Did Jesus say, don't worry? I'm going to rapture those at the end of the age so that nothing will happen to them. Sorry you got martyred. He didn't say that. He said, and white robes were given unto every one of them. Why? This is a future. They're going to be in the kingdom of God. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season. Yes, rest in your grave. Stay there. Time will pass until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That's the Bible. Not you're going to be raptured out in advance. Every righteous person throughout history has always suffered persecution. Now there are at least three places in the Bible that does talk about a place of safety for those that Jesus Christ accounts worthy. Or that He's going to seal them before the heavenly signs come and plunge asteroids into the earth. Near extinction level events, the first four trumpets in chapter 8 of Revelation. He's going to seal them so they will survive and be alive because he said in Matthew 24, 21, and 22, except for the elect's sake, no flesh should be saved. So he's preserving some of his people. But only those that he accounts worthy, all others are going to have war made against them, and they will be overcome. Believe me, when you teach this, you don't have a big following. But it's biblical. And if you compromise on one thing, you'll compromise on another. And another, and another, till you're just like everybody else. So if you don't compromise on anything, the seats are empty, most of them. And you know what? That's okay. God is in charge. Jesus is head of the church. He's the one that adds to the church those that should be saved. In Jeremiah 23, verse 18 to 28, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard His word? Who has marked His word and heard it? In other words, which of these ministers and prophets have been corrected by the Word of God and they listened to it and they read it and they said, I will not change the word of it. I will only speak what is in the book. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until He has executed, till He has performed the thoughts of His heart in the latter days. You shall consider it perfectly. Yes, he says in verse 21, and if you want the absolute truth, you go to God's Word. He said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. If they had been called of God, they would have spoken the words of God and not twisted for their own purposes. They wouldn't care if they had to eat peanut butter. They wouldn't care if they had to walk. But they would preach the truth. Verse 22, And if they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I am a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Yes, He's the head of the church. And he knows who are his. He said, my sheep hear my voice. He said, I am the great shepherd of the sheep. I know my sheep. Jesus knows who is his. He's not a God way off somewhere. He knows how to perfectly correct us so that we can stand in the day of trouble, so that we can get problems out of our lives today so that He can account us worthy to escape the things that are coming, to help preserve mankind alive. We cannot listen to and we cannot be a part of those 
that are the prophets that are condemned in the Bible because they will not listen to God's Word. God's Word is the truth. It's the truth, the only truth. Not the Koran, not the Zoroastrian so-called holy books. None of those are the truth. Verse 24, Can any hide himself in secret places that I cannot see him? Yes, God asked that. You and I can't hide from God. Those prophets that preach falsely can't either. Do not I fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I've heard what the prophets said, that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I've dreamed. Just like I've relayed before how that on television one day, of in Oklahoma, on a national broadcast, a man was just talking, and then all of a sudden he said, held his hand up to his head right over his eye and said, Yes, Lord, I'll tell him. And proceeded to tell the biggest lie I thought of ten scriptures immediately that contradicted everything the man said. And then it wasn't two minutes later till it did it again. Deceiving the people. God said, I see you. You're not getting away with anything. You say you dreamed. It wasn't a dream for me. It's out of your own thought processes, for your own purposes, to deceive people and get their money. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they're prophets of the deceit of their own heart. You know, this is hard to give a sermon about false prophets when you are standing before the congregation as a minister. But if your conscience is clear, you don't have to worry about it, do you? Verse 27, Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forsaken my name for Baal. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. Underline that, faithfully. If anybody ever hopes to be a minister of God, you better know that you better speak those words faithfully. If you don't speak them faithfully, you will come under the same condemnation as all these other ministers, these false prophets. Yes, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He knows who are His. He listens. If we think our digital equipment and our DVDs are top technology, we don't know anything yet what God has. He's going to be able to replay everything that any minister on the earth has ever spoken and ask them why. Why did you lie to those people that day? Why did you deceive them and take them away from me so that they don't even know who I am? Oh yes, they blabber a name that sounds familiar to the Bible, but they don't know my character. They don't know who I am, how I live, how I act how I treat my fellow human beings because He came into human flesh so that He could experience it. Jeremiah 23, verse 29 to 31. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? There would be repentance all over the place if people, if every single minister in this country was forced to tell the truth. There would either be full houses or they would be empty. And they would be finding ways to hang the minister. Verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They steal them because they won't tell them the truth. They won't tell them if you're committing adultery, you're a sinner and you've got to stop it. If you're committing fornication, premarital sexual activity, you're a sinner and you've got to stop it. If you're breaking God's law in any way, you've got to stop it and turn around and live righteous before God. Verse 31, Behold, I'm against the prophet, says the Lord, that used their tongues and says, He says, they stand up there and say, God said, He gave me a message, God said, or better yet, God said. 
and then you throw up all over the floor because you know they're being deceived. And if the words had not been stolen from the people's ears, they would repent and turn, but they've been deceived. Jeremiah 23 continues in the indictment, and it is not a pleasant indictment. Verse 32 to 40. Behold, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and do tell them. Tell them as if they were truth. And cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not. I didn't even give them the dream. You study uh, Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 to 8 very carefully, and you'll see that God said if somebody rises up, a prophet among you, and if that person, whatever he says and forecasts, happens, but if they turn you away from his law, his commandments, they were to stone him to death, even though it happened. So it's more important to God that we obey him than I don't care how many prophecies people say they have. It doesn't matter about that. Obedience is what's important to God. Development of character is what's important to God. Yes, a vision is fine. A dream is fine if they come to pass. And especially if it's by someone who obeys God. Verse 32, the latter part. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. I've known more disillusioned people because they just don't know what to believe anymore. You know, they have been so misled and let down when their expectations are so high they couldn't even believe the truth when they heard it. Because they couldn't believe anybody. They couldn't trust anybody. And that is a shame. And that's what Jesus Christ prophesied right here against the prophets and the false ministers. When this people, verse 33, or the prophet or the priest shall ask you, saying, What is the burden of the Lord? Is there a burden in obeying God? No. You shall then, you shall then say unto them, What burden? I will even forsake you, says the Lord. Yeah, if you think it's a burden to obey God, he says, I'll clean myself out of your life. I'll let you live on your own. See what kind of a burden you have then when everything in the world goes wrong for you. Maybe you'll come crying back to me on your knees and say, God, it's not a burden to obey you. I love your law. As for the prophet and the priest and the people that shall say, the burden of the Lord, I'll even punish that man in his house. Yeah, I remember reading scriptures in the Old Testament when Babylon... The Jews had been taken into Babylonian captivity and they came back. They couldn't wait for the sun to go down. They didn't want to keep the Sabbath. They couldn't wait till it went down so they could set up their shops and start selling and buying again. And it was a burden to obey God. No, it's not. It should be a joy. He has lit up our life. He's given us an understanding that the masses of this world have no conception of. He's called us to become kings and priests so that we can educate the rest of the world. And yet He's condemning these, these ministers and prophets and priests that will not obey Him and speak His words. Verse 35, Thus shall you say every one to his neighbor and every one to his brother, What has the Lord answered? What has the Lord spoken? And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to live God's way, if you're going to understand that through thick or thin you have a covenant with God, He will deliver you before you're down and out every time. He allows things to test you, to try you, to develop your character. And when you turn to this God with happiness in your trials and thank Him in your trials 
Instead of saying, God, if you don't get me out of this, I'm quitting the church. I've known of people that have done that. They're no longer among us. They had a bitterness toward God because they would not be corrected of God. They wanted their own way instead of God's way. That's the false ministers. That's the false priests. Yes, verse 36. And the burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For you have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Brethren, you and I cannot pervert words. We must repent and overcome. We can't let anything go out of the pulpit that is a perversion. But that's my responsibility. Your responsibility is to speak one to another. Never to let a perverted word go out of your mouth. Never one perverted word. Then you're disobeying God. You're fitting yourself into the same category that God is giving a stinging indictment against those that cause people to err. Because when you give a perverted word out of your mouth about another brother or sister or a situation that happened, then all of a sudden you've changed the thought process of somebody toward that person when they might have loved them with all their heart at one time. Now they're skeptical of them. Perverted words destroy. That's why God put a whole chapter in the Bible about priests that pervert His words and cause His people to err. Verse 37, Thus shall you say to the prophet, What has the Lord answered? I believe I read that. Verse 38, But since you say the burden of the Lord, therefore thus says the Lord, because you say this word, it's a burden for you to obey, the burden of the Lord, and, I've, and I have sent unto you, saying, You shall not say the burden of the Lord. Yeah, I told you not to, but you did it anyway. You were going to have your own way. You were stubborn. You were hard-hearted. Notice what he says then in verse 39. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you. What did he say back there in Matthew seven twenty-three To the ministers that were living iniquity. A lawless lifestyle. But they were performing miracles apparently in the name of Jesus by His authority saying, Jesus is the Savior. Give your heart to the Lord. No, you repent. And you're converted inside because you've changed your mind. He said, I'll forsake you in the city that I gave you and your father's. And cast you out of my presence. Brethren, it is a dangerous thing for us to ever think that we can pervert God's ways in our own words, whether it's from the pulpit or privately among individuals. Perversion God hates. He showed it right there in that chapter. I will close with two scriptures now. Isaiah 28. I want you to realize that you and I who have the Holy Spirit of God and have an understanding of God's ways cannot look down upon any of these false ministers and the people who are deceived. We can't do it. God left Satan in the world and He left the demons. They are the ones who are deceiving according to Revelation 12.9. And God also put His book in such, He wrote it in such a form that unless the Holy Spirit is indeed inside of your mind, you cannot understand it. You will think that it will contradict itself in a hundred different ways when it won't. But because you don't know how to put it together, you have no understanding. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 9 to 13. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with st 
stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Now why would God write the Bible where you've got to take a little piece over here and a little piece from over here and then another piece from over here and put all that together? Why didn't he write it in a straight line? In a column and say, number one, this is it. Number two, this is it. Verse 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backwards and be broken, snared, and taken. God has deliberately allowed the world to be deceived. He's only choosing kings and priests today. That's why he's making a difference in us and them. Two different pronouns. The world and God's people. God's people have his Holy Spirit. The rest of the world does not. Therefore, it is up to you and I to live by a biblical motto. That biblical motto is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. 